At the U.S. Open this past week, Louis Oosthuizen was on the 17th hole and needed to sink this fairly long putt to stay just one stroke behind the leader. That would give him a chance to tie, maybe even to win. And if you were watching at this particular station in Iowa, guess what happened just as the ball was approaching the hole? This Iowa TV station interrupted just all of a sudden with a severe weather alert right at the wrong time. He missed it, but in life, interruptions are going to happen. But here's the good news. God is still in control, and he has a plan for your interruptions. Yes, we want to learn to flow with God's interruptions, and we want to learn to put in God's hands The interruptions that oftentimes don't seem to be from him. So let's get ready. Get ready for interruptions. Anytime, anywhere. Paul tells Timothy he should always be ready to preach. 2 Timothy 4, verse 2. First part of that verse is preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. John Wesley, one of my heroes of the faith, told his preachers that they should always be ready to preach, pray, or die at a moment's notice. I'll never forget the time that Lisa and I visited a church in Chile, South America. We were there on an internship, and as this service began, the pastor welcomed the guest preacher. Guess who that was? It was me, and I was shocked, but I made it through. We might not all be called to preach, and most of us won't be called on to die for our faith. Praise God for that. But the principle of always being ready applies to all of us as followers of Jesus. Peter put it this way in 1 Peter 3, verse 15. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Being ready for interruptions in these cases isn't just about having an interruptible mindset. It's more than just being open to interruptions. It's more than just flowing with interruptions. Being interruptible is a matter of being prepared. Being ready by being prepared for the interruptions that are likely to come your way when you're living for Jesus. In the two scriptures we just looked at, it's about being prepared to speak what God has called us to speak. The word of God and the reason for our hope. We have to be a people of hope, right? And we need to know why we have hope. We need to be prepared. We need to be ready. We need to grow in the word of God because interruptions are going to come. And The question is, are you going to be ready for them? Know your God. Be prepared by knowing God. Know your hope. Know who you are in God. And then being interruptible will set you up for powerful impact on your world. Here's a good reason to be ready for interruptions. Second point, interruptions can lead to miracles. (laughs) Naturally, we tend not to welcome interruptions. Why? They, they mess up our schedules. They can be messy. They're unplanned. They upset us. They upset our plans. They make us late for things. They keep us from doing what we want to do, and so on. Maybe we can change our perspective on that in this series over the next few weeks. I think if we can, we're going to make life much more exciting. We're going to make our faith much more exciting because not only are we going to be ready to share a witness just anytime anybody would ask us, anytime there's an open door, we're going to be ready to see the intervention of God. Interruptions can be messy. They can be destructive. Can you imagine this? Having a meeting in somebody else's home. You're teaching. And then all of a sudden, the ceiling caves in and four guys lower a crippled man right down in front of you, in front of you, the teacher. Well, that happened to Jesus. And you can read about this. We're not going to read the whole passage, but you can read about this in Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Jesus was preaching in a home, and it was so crowded that no one else could get in. And there were these four 
men, four friends, who were so determined to get their crippled friend to Jesus that they dug a hole in the roof and dropped the crippled man on ropes right down in front of Jesus. Think about that. That's an interruption that was problematic in a couple of ways. It it ruined somebody's roof. (laughs) That's a big deal. And it caused Jesus to stop preaching whatever he was preaching. Man, interrupting Jesus, preaching, that doesn't sound (laughs) very appropriate, does it? And here's the interesting thing about Mark's account of this. Mark does not even tell us what Jesus was preaching. What does Mark record? He records the interruption. Wow! As far as Jesus' ministry in that moment, the interruption was a higher priority than Jesus' preaching. That's amazing. The interruption provided its own preaching moment. It was a powerful opportunity for Jesus to teach on his authority, his authority to forgive sins, and his authority to heal. And he demonstrated that. He didn't just talk about it, he did it. The interruption allowed that. So Jesus himself, who surely has a higher purpose than any of us, was amazingly interruptible. In fact, almost all of Jesus' miracles were interruptions. Somebody told me that all of them were, I don't know. Read about them and see. But I think that we today would be able to see a lot more miracles if we were more like Jesus in this regard, being interruptible. See, being interruptible being interruptible says to God, Lord, we're available. We're available for your agenda. Your agenda is better than our agenda. Your agenda, Lord, is wonderful. Your agenda is miraculous. Being interruptible says that we're available to God. And it also says that we are available to love people. So be ready, expect miracles, and then understand that being interruptible is a powerful measure of your love for your neighbor. Jesus was asked about loving a neighbor, and to illustrate loving neighbors, what did Jesus do? He told a parable. What's the main aspect of that parable? It's an interruption. We read about that in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. It says, On one occasion an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, He asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied, do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. In other words, he allowed his trip to be interrupted. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will re- reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. So he was not only interruptible, but he gave his resources to the Lord. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. The priest and the Levite were the ones that Jesus' listeners would have expected to be good neighbors, to be interruptible, to show love. But for reasons that Jesus doesn't specify in the parable, they refused to be bothered by the interruption of finding a dead man on the roadside, a dying man, half dead, it says in Scripture. Instead, it was the unlikely Samaritan who helped out the wounded man. And even though he was a Samaritan, he was the one who was the neighbor. 
He's the neighbor. He's the one who led his schedule, his finances, his comfort, his donkey, everything be disrupted. He was the one who was interruptible. So again, to drive home the point about loving neighbors as ourselves, Jesus tells a parable that hinges on being interruptible. I think about applying that to my own life as a pastor, you know, somebody who might be in the same order as a Levite or a priest. One Sunday I was on the way to church when we were meeting at Methacton High School, and the car in front of me ran a red light and crashed with another car. What should I do? And I'm thinking I have hundreds of people waiting to hear me preach, to preach a sermon that could change their lives. I'm confident of that. And I'm called and commissioned by God to speak to his flock, right? I mean, that's such a high priority. What a privilege. I need to get to where I'm going because, you know, it's important that everything start on time, right? Right, it should start on time. That's a good principle to live by. So what should I do? Of course, I did what I think you would expect of me. I I needed to stop and be available for whatever I could do whether rendering aid, being a witness when the police came, praying for somebody who was injured. But fortunately, the crash was really minor. And, uh, you know, thanks to the guy that swerved when he saw the person run the red light, and nobody was injured, not at all. But how loving would it have been for me not to be willing to be interrupted? It wouldn't have been love at all. So loving our neighbors is about being interruptible. And Here's another thing I think we need to look at as we begin this sermon series on interruptions because interruptions are part of everyday life. And, you know, they're not just all glamorous and spiritual. So let's make sure we're not spiritualizing things and glamorizing being interruptible because, you know, there might be some powerful miracles and some amazing things that happen, but interruptions probably aren't usually about finding strangers on the roadside or witnessing a car accident or a powerful, amazing miracle. Interruptions probably aren't usually about those signs and wonders. Interruptions are about your everyday life. In one of his letters, C.S. Lewis wrote, and I've adapted this slightly to make it easier to understand. He says this, the great thing is to stop regarding all the unpleasant things as interruptions of your own or real life. The truth is that what you call the interruptions are precisely your real life. The life God is sending you day by day. It's the interruption of, you know, a kid to a parent. And my adaptation of of this statement by C.S. Lewis is this. Interruptions aren't deviations from your life. They are your life. So here's some key points that I just want to wrap up with and offer to you as something that can help you make the most of this sermon series. Loving God means being available to Him. Loving people means being available to them. And it's important here, let's establish this right from the beginning, being interruptible does not mean you have no boundaries. And your life just is not your own at all. It belongs to God. It's his, it's his life that you're living. But it doesn't mean it just belongs to everybody who would want to interrupt you. See, if you're always subject to interruptions, always, you're probably not going to fulfill your primary purposes. And if you're never subject to interruptions, never, you're probably not going to fulfill your primary purposes. Because why? You won't be as available to God. You can't plan everything. And you won't be as available to people as God would have you be. So we have to learn how to bypass the wrong interruptions. Jesus didn't embrace every interruption that came his way. Though all of his miracles perhaps were interruptions, he didn't allow every interruption to stop him from what he needed to do. When Jesus went away to pray, even when people were looking looking for him, Uh, when he moved on to other towns and villages, even when people wanted him to stay, he was not open to interruptions in those cases sometimes. And if you decide to spend some time in prayer, I can almost guarantee that your prayer time will be interrupted, right? You know what I'm talking about. 
Susanna Wesley had so many kids that to pray and avoid interruptions, she would sit with an apron over her head. I think she had about nine kids at her home at the one time. And the result of her commitment to prayer without interruptions is this. Two of her sons, John and Charles Wesley, changed the course of Western history through their revival leadership back in the 1700s. We're here today, largely because of that. Some of us, let's get it established right here in this first summer in the series, some of us are too interruptible. We're too interruptible by the wrong things. Uh, some of us need to turn off the notifications on our cell phones. <laughs> I'm guilty. Some of us just probably need to leave our cell phones at home sometime. I I read that in an article. And just last week, Lisa and I went out to lunch with another couple. And I decided I'm just going to turn my phone off completely. Not silence it. Turn it off. And that strategy worked for about two minutes. (laughs) When I realized that uh, to see a menu, I needed to scan a code using my phone. Well, you know, at least I was conscious of not referring to my phone, not looking at it. So we need to learn how to bypass the wrong interruptions. And we also have to learn how to embrace the right interruptions. This sermon series, I know, is going to help you do this. So let's believe that for your witness for Jesus, it's going to go to new levels because you're going to learn to Embrace interruptions that allow you to share your hope. Let's believe that your life as a follower of Jesus is going to get more exciting because that's when you're going to see miracles. When you're interrupted, you're ready for miracles. Let's believe that you're going to make a difference in the lives of other people because you're interruptible when people are in real need and you can do something about it. And let's believe that even the everydayness of life will be a little less stressful, a little more enjoyable because you come to see interruptions as part of real life. Just part of life. The life that God is sending you day by day. Let this sermon series help you to entrust each moment of your life more fully to God. Let me ask you this. Have you entrusted your entire life to God? Jesus came to bring you life and life to the full. He came to make the moments of your life truly meaningful. And to make your life meaningful in such a way that the good things that God does in and through your life last forever because you will live forever with God. But it starts by receiving the life that Jesus Christ brought to you through his death, burial, and resurrection. Would you say yes to Jesus? I want to lead you in a prayer to just commit your life to God and then to expect God to do some wonderful things in you and to bring you the abundant life and eternal life. Just repeat this prayer after me. Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for your love. I believe Jesus died. He was raised from the dead. And he is Lord. Be the Lord of my life. Forgive me of my sins. And help me to live for you. I'm yours God. Every moment. Every aspect of my life. Belongs to you. In Jesus name. Amen. You just made the best decision. Of your life. Stick around. And somebody's going to come. And share with you some very important next steps. Thanks for being with us. And everybody, if you are blessed by this message, then make sure that you're back next week. Invite somebody to watch with you. God bless you.